So I would like to each of the panelists to introduce themselves briefly and I'll introduce them as I see them uh, on in the order I see them on my screen. So um, uh, Bruce, please, if you could uh, please briefly introduce yourself. And you, you're on mute, by the way, so please. On, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> everybody. Um, I'm, I'm Bruce Anderson. I'm the founder and CEO of 24-7 Solar. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of my friends out there watching. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce, and, and very welcome. And uh, Jane, please, if you could introduce yourself uh, next. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Jim Krauss, uh, Chief Revenue Officer for Capstone Turbine Corporation, um, now Capstone Green Energy. Um, excited to be here and uh, looking forward to uh, hearing uh, what Bruce and the other partners have to say as we try and uh, move the 24-7 CSP technology into the marketplace. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. And uh, Rainer, please, if you could uh, briefly introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Hello, my name is Ryan Book. I'm uh, part of DLR, German Aerospace uh, Center, and I'm working there at the uh, Institute of Solar Research. I'm heading the Department of uh, Solar High Temperature Technologies, and I'm happy to be participant here in the discussion round. Thank you, um, Rainer. So, um, right, well, um, you know, I'm happy to have uh, all of you here, and thank you to everyone who is here. Uh, with us in the audience as well. We'll, we'll now play a short video and uh, um, after the video, we'll start with the presentations with uh, Bruce will, will be the first one to, to present. So, yeah. Okay. Well, that was a pretty fast video, huh? It was, very, it was extremely short, so thank you very much. <laughs> well, <laughs> is there any way to try it again? Can you can you get yeah. can you play the complete one? Yeah, we'll try again. Twenty four seven solar plants are a game changing way to produce electricity that generate base load clean power around the clock. 24-7 in any weather at costs competitive with PV today and coal tomorrow at scale. These modular turnkey systems use factory-built components, most of which can be manufactured locally with few moving parts for low maintenance and rapid low-cost deployment. 24-7 solar plants use the world's lowest cost solar mirrors to drive a proprietary hot air based Brayton cycle system that operates at atmospheric pressure and requires no steam, molten salts or oils. They combine the world's highest temperature solar receiver which heats air to 970 degrees centigrade with the world's lowest cost storage which stores up to 15 hours of the sun's energy as heat instead of electricity plus the world's most versatile reliable power generator to create a breakthrough third generation CSP system that stabilizes grids by responding instantly to changing demand. 24-7 solar plants eliminate most disadvantages of conventional CSP, PV, wind and traditional power and offer unmatched benefits for project developers and grid operators. They can be deployed on uneven ground and configured as a single off-grid system of 400 kilowatts or as utility scale farms of unlimited capacity. Short project cycles, lower o and and competitive margins mean attractive returns for investors. 24-7 Solar. The business opportunities are breathtaking. Well, um, right. So um, we'll get started with uh, the first presentation by Bruce. And actually, before you start, Bruce, I'd like to... Uh, remind everybody almost forgot of a tradition we have at APA Insights. Let us know on the chat uh, box where you're joining from. So today I'm actually joining from Berlin. So um, Bruce, over to you. All right. Well, uh, thank you again, everybody, for joining. I'm very excited to bring this to you. We've been working on this uh, technology for quite some time with partners uh, such as uh, Capstone and, and the DLR and others. And our goal is to produce power 24 hours a day at uh, the cost and price of PV. That's a ways away, but um, you'll see why we think we can get there. A little background on, on uh, 
the company where we are originally a spinoff from MIT. And in fact, MIT owns part of us. Uh, U.S. Department of Energy provided us with considerable amount of, of development funding some years ago. And um, we've really uh, had great collaboration from, from around the world uh, during that, those development stages. Um, we know about, about conventional CSP and it's been underrated and under, under uh, deployed. Uh, it's making good progress now, it's making a good comeback, but there are really other opportunities for getting 24 seven uh, CSP. And, and that's to imagine, if you would for just a minute, that we can take the, the best of PV, which is low cost, low risk, rapid deployment, and both small and large scale, and the best of CSP, which is of course that it's 27, uh, 24 seven operational and, and 24 seven dispatchable. And we can get uh, rid of the worst of PV, which is sunshine only, it's not dispatchable. And the worst of PV, which is its cost complexity and long project cycles and financing and so on. And we can also add additional benefits. Uh, and one of those, I'll let you read these, but the thing that I'll, I'll not mention often enough, but which is very, very important, is that it provides a, a really larger uh, commercial opportunity because the smaller scales have so many, uh, smaller scale, which we're gonna show you today, have so many more applications um, that uh, until you're in this business, you can't, you can't imagine. And part of the reason for those numerous uh, potential applications is not only the smaller size and the ability to uh, uh, deploy CSP on a distributed basis, but also because it offers industrial grade, indu uh, in industrial grade waste heat, about 250C. Now, um, why is modularization so important? The key is getting costs down. And if PV and wind have shown us anything, that it's factory production that gets costs down. You've got to put as much of the cost of a CSP system as possible in a factory to get those cost reductions. And also, of course, what modularization and standardization does is reduces the costs on the site to deploy it. So you've got speedy deployment and that gives way to rapid cost reductions. That's key in energy. Um, energy competitiveness is based on cost along with some of the other attributes you could bring to it like zero carbon and, and so on, but cost is the principal driver. So we must get our costs down. Modularization is a key approach to getting costs down. At, uh, as I said, it opens the huge markets. Um, our system is standardized. Every system's identical, 400 kilowatts, and we have a five megawatt system on the drawing board. Short time to power revenues. And what I mean by that is that, let's say you're deploying 10 megawatts on a, with a modular system. The first module that you erect and connect to the grid, you're producing power. So you don't have to wait for the entire project to be deployed before you start generating revenues and value. Um, and our system doesn't use any water steam. We don't use molten salts. We don't use oils. And we have fewer, very few moving parts. We have a few dampers and a few blowers. And that's really it. Except of course, that the capstone turbine spins um, and the, uh, the heliostats of course, track, track the, the sky, uh, the sun. Um, it's also something that can be put together like wind farms or, or PV farms, uh, off-grid, mini-grids, uh, distributed or utility scale. Uh, these are firmly dispatchable every hour of the year. One of the reasons for that is the redundancy. Each of our systems has two capstone turbines. And when you have, again, so let's say a 10 megawatt system, you have 25 of these systems. And these, these turbines will produce power even when there's a problem with the solar side of the system. So you've got all that redundancy. And these systems don't need a backup power plant when one of those turbines goes down. It's its own backup system. Uh, so it's also low risk because most of this equipment is proven. Uh, there's nothing really exotic about this. Uh, the materials are relatively simple. Operation simple. 
Um, the environmental uh, applications are really straightforward because it has very little impact on the environment. And again, there's waste heat for water purification, industrial steam, and so on and so forth. The first big uh, technical breakthrough that was required was to heat, uh, because we were using turbines and air turbines require higher temperatures than steam turbines. Uh, our, our turbine, the capstone turbine, has a turbine inlet temperature between 920 and 940 degrees centigrade. And so we need to heat air to a much high, to even a higher temperature by 10, 20 degrees because we put it through a heat exchanger. And um, I'm gonna get back to that in a few minutes, but first I'm gonna let um, Reiner go and Reiner's gonna give us some background on the origins of the solar receiver and, and its fundamentals and its performance. Uh, and I'll just say in contrast to what Reiner's gonna show you, which is high pressure, uh, we have, uh, ours is at ambient pressure. Uh, so Reiner, over to you and I'll stop sharing. Okay, thank you. No, not me. Okay, hope you can see my screen now. I will give you now an overview over the uh, work on the receiver side. We were happy to, to join 24 seven solar team and we are mainly involved uh, in the uh, receiver design supporting 24 seven solar there uh, with the design and with the manufacturing also, and also with regard to some of the system aspects. Okay, so where <clears throat> did we come from? Uh, we can say that we have a very long expertise in volumetric air receivers, and this is the technology which is also used here in 24 seven solar uh, technology. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, done a lot of developments with pressurized receivers, with non-pressurized receivers. Uh, we use different absorber structures uh, like wire meshes up to temperatures of 800 centigrade, ceramic foams and ceramic matrix structures up to temperatures of 1000 centigrade. And we have also uh, some experience with quartz windows, both for uh, pressurized applications and uh, segmented quartz windows, which are capable with uh, to work without pressure. So uh, one example, which was uh, developed in, uh, together with other partners in the past is what you see here uh, in this picture. And <clears throat> to explain to you, uh, we have a pressure vessel. So this was an, a pressurized system. We have a pressure vessel, which has an opening, an aperture, which is covered by a domed quartz window. And the dome geometry is necessary to withstand the high operating pressure. We were operating those systems uh, up to pressures of 15 bar, which were state of the art, um, are state of the art in, in modern gas turbine systems. Uh, so. This unit is placed at the focal spot of the solar tower system. And uh, the radiation is entering through a secondary, which is not always necessary, but in some cases. And then the radiation enters through the aperture, through passes, is transmitted through the quartz window, and then hits the volumetric absorber structure, which also has a dome-like structure. We call this section here the inlet section because the, the air which comes from the gas turbine compressor and uh, the recuperator, the air is then moving inwards to this um, uh, wide volume uh, and uh, part or very small part of, of the incident radiation is captured here and then it enters the main section which is the biggest part of the absorber structure and the uh, air is then passing through this porous structure, the volumetric absorber. And uh, this structure is heated up by the concentrated radiation and the air is heated to the required outlet temperature uh, by <clears throat> uh, convection, convective heat transfer from the very porous uh, absorber structure. It's then collected and uh, move, is moving towards the, the exit duct. So this was the pressurized concept that we used uh, in various uh, approaches, 
What you see up here on the top section is an example of a system which used uh, tubes, metallic tubes, uh, with also a small gas turbine system. And in front, uh, it's a little bit, dif little bit difficult to identify, but in front you have segmented quartz, windows quartz uh, strips, which are placed one beside the other. And they uh, help a lot to reduce the convective losses and the thermal radiation losses. So, uh, basically, this were the, the starting point that we were coming from. Uh, we had successful solar receiver tests with gas turbine cycles. One test was performed at the Plataforma Solar uh, together with a helicopter engine and a, a modified helicopter engine operating in the range of 230 kilowatt electric power output. Uh, we had a successful operation. Uh, using receiver temperatures up to uh, 1000 centigrades. Uh, now the, the next step after that was a, a pro project together with Abengoa and other partners. And at that time we used a solar mercury 50 uh, gas turbine with a power level of four and a half megawatt together with uh, this type of receiver, pressurized volumetric receiver. This was used uh, and at that time we were operating up to temperatures of 800 centigrades. All these uh, tests were done in hybrid operation. So we had uh, part of the energy uh, from the energy collected from the sun, from the heliostat field. And we also added uh, fuel uh, to bring the temperature up to the required turbine inner temperature. At that time, because the, uh, the combustors that were used at that time were not capable to accept the full uh, high temperature inlet going up to 1000 centigrade, which for example, in the case of the 230 kilowatt engine would have been suitable to do solar only operation. So <clears throat> starting on this, uh, what was the evolution to 24 seven solar receiver concept? Uh, we were in, engaged in looking into different concept, different modifications with 24 seven solar. And the issue was that the, uh, they did not want to go for the pressurized volumetric receiver approach because of the safety issues with the domed window, which is quartz glass, a brittle material. Uh, and this domed window is under high pressure. Uh, so this is a little bit critical with respect to the safety. They did not want to go that way. And the other issue is that an active cooling system is required for the window ceiling because you have to make sure that you ha always have a very even uh, ceiling uh, of the window in order to avoid uh, stresses which would lead to uh, this damage of the quartz window. So. Uh, based on these regions, 24-7 uh, Solar developed uh, its own approach uh, with an air receiver, a volumetric air receiver at ambient pressure. Uh, and the heating of the gas turbine cycle is then done uh, by an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. Uh, the, the large window that uh, is intended to be used there is of course uh, sensitive to pressure load. So for this reason, an additional exhaust blower is used to control the uh, near zero pressure difference over the window to keep the, the window in, in stable operating conditions. And then we use volumetric absorber structures as we did in previous uh, receiver designs, uh, wire mesh at the inlet section because there we operate at lower temperatures and the high porosity silicon carbide foam at the outlet section. Uh, just to give you an indication of the operating conditions, uh, the receiver in a typical layout is installed at the height of something like 31 meter, uh, tilted by, uh, for example, 24 degree, uh, yeah, degrees. And it's operating at ambient pressure with an air inlet temperature of 650 centigrades. This is defined by the gas turbine cycle, uh, the exit temperature of the of the uh, recuperator. Uh, and it's designed for an air outlet temper of 970 centigrade. Uh, and of course, the, the overall system has a fuel backup option. And it's also designed to operate with a the thermal storage. 
And the, the way how it operates, remember the receiver is at uh, ambient pressure. Then of course, when it goes down uh, to, the, uh, to the heat exchanger, which heats the, the uh, inlet temperature, the inlet air to the turbine, uh, you have additional pressure, pressure drop. Eventually you, you can introduce also fuel here to heat up uh, if there is not enough uh, uh, energy coming from the sun, from the receiver. And then the additional component is here, this exhaust blower, which helps or which is controlling by some uh, minor suction pressure uh, that the receiver is always at ambient pressure. In case we have the operation of the thermal storage, we apply this blower here, which creates an additional mass flow uh, and in addition to the mass flow defined by the micro turbines. And this additional mass flow uh, gets the additional energy uh, if, uh, if the uh, energy is available from the sun and uh, puts it into the thermal storage. And uh, when there is no sun or not sufficient sun available, we can use and extract the energy from the thermal storage and uh, use it for, for the gas turbine unit. Here are some images of the, some of the components. This is the quartz window, which is intended for operation with the receiver. It has a diameter of about two meters. So you see a person here standing beside of the, the first prototype of that unit. It's built from multiple parallel quartz tubes, which are cut uh, in the axial direction. And the segments are not interconnected. They are put uh, very closely together. So there is nearly no gap between them, but they, they can, uh, they can more or less move freely one against the other, which helps to prevent uh, the uh, stresses which appear if you have very large inhomogeneously heated uh, surfaces, uh, 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 structures. It is equipped with an anti-reflective coating, which helps to, to avoid uh, the reflective losses which typically occur on quartz windows. And uh, it's mounted, as you can see here, uh, on both ends. We have ceramic structures which uh, which keep the uh, the uh, the quartz segments in place, but allowing for some flexibility and and some movement to avoid uh, stresses. Uh, the other important component is the ceramic foam absorber. It's built from silicon carbide foam absorber. Uh, and, and it has a porosity of 20 ppi, uh, a pore size of 20 ppi, and an open porosity uh, above 90%. Uh, that means the struts of these ceramic foams are very thin, and we have uh, quite effective convective heat transfer in these uh, in these structures. And in addition to that, we apply a mass flow distribution setup. That means at the back side uh, where the air is exiting at the non-irradiated side, we apply ceramic structures like this, where you see a hole pattern in the structure. And this hole pattern defines the mass flow distribution. So at those sections, which, uh, which, want to, which we want to have more mass flow uh, passing through the structures because they, they get more radiation. Uh, we have more holes allowing for more, uh, more mass flow through these structures. Uh, uh, and then those sections where we want to have a lower mass flow because of lower irradiation and these sections, we have a smaller or less holes. Uh, and the overall pressure difference between front and back side of these structures is always the same. So with, with the application of those uh, structures at the exit side of the absorber structures, we can uh, implement a specific mass flow distribution, which then matches the, uh, the irradiation distribution on the absorber surface. Uh, of course, uh, since the system is uh, in, in preparation, we do not have measurement results, but the pre predicted performance from our simulation models 
is given here. And this is based on a heliostat field layout using 205 heliostats, each with 16 square meters, located uh, in a, in a uh, site at Daggett, California, just as, a, as an example. And uh, the expected performance of the receiver is now that we have uh, a solar flux at the aperture uh, uh, with something more than 3.1 megawatt. The flux at the absorber uh, is then uh, a little bit less than three megawatts. We have, of course, thermal losses. So the absorbed power of the receiver is predicted to be two and a half megawatt. This is the design power level of the uh, receiver. And this is also including a certain solar multiple to be able to charge the thermal storage uh, during uh, most times of the day. Uh, and the resulting receiver efficiency, the predicted receiver efficiency is in the range of 85%, 86%. Uh, doing this on the annual base, the annual performance, uh, we have a total predicted output uh, from the receiver of uh, six gigawatt and uh, the predicted receiver efficiency uh, as an annual average is 82%. And with this, I conclude my presentation on the receiver side and give it back to Bruce. Okay. Uh, Carlos, can I go ahead and share my screen again? I guess I can, there you go. Yeah, please All go right. Ahead. Okay. So uh, this is what Reiner was showing us. Um, and we've got the inlet air from the turbine at about 650 coming in, uh, going through the wire mesh here, uh, and then through the outlet absorber there. Um, and here, here it is on top of a tower. Uh, uh, and and I, I don't know if you mentioned this, Reiner, but uh, Fraunhofer. Um, uh, and uh, and DLR de uh, developed the um, uh, the ceramic the volumetric absorber. So, yeah, the volumetric absorber. Um, and not only can the solar receiver power the uh, our system, the twenty four seven solar plant, but we can direct all of that high temperature heat to a an industrial process, rather than using any of it to produce electricity or we can do a combination of the two. Uh, and that has a lot of applications, of course. Uh, we hope that in the future, we can raise the outlet temperature and, and perhaps, for, uh, perhaps uh, uh, st uh, do ther uh, ther uh, the thermal, for thermal chemical processes of various kinds. And that's not a subject we know a lot about, but it's an aspiration. And then we've got a third, a second primary system to our uh, to our 24 seven solar plant. And of course that's thermal storage. Um, what you're looking at here is what um, in the industry for over a hundred years, uh, approaching 200 uh, is called a, a copper stove or hot blast stove or hot blast furnace used by the steel industry, glass, metal processing, um, operating at higher temperatures than, than we do and operate at a much larger scale. So basically we've shrinked a very proven technology. It has no moving parts. And what we do is take the air from, from the receiver during the day, pass it down through the top and inside our storage media. Uh, they could be small size ceramic pellets, uh, for example, from Sangoban. Uh, it can be sand even, uh, it can be iron slag waste, uh, very versatile. Um, now we're coming to uh, the other third um, major uh, uh, subsystem of, of our 24-7 uh, solar plant. And this we regard as the most versatile and reliable power generator of its size. And if you're not familiar with turbines, think of jet engines. That's really the, the analogy here. Uh, to our knowledge, it's the first ever commercial turbine that's able to convert atmospheric pressure hot air. Now just think about that, atmospheric pressure uh, to electricity, no combustion, no emissions. Also to our knowledge, it's the first ever commercial turbine able to burn 100% hydrogen. 
Capstone has come down a long way. I think you're up to 60% uh, hydrogen, Jim, with your standard turbine. And also uh, the standard turbine can burn uh, some dirty flare gases. Uh, this one, because of the, um, uh, the design flexibility of the, of the, um, of the combustor can burn um, almost any dirty flare gas. It can also burn low grade methane. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim. Thank, thanks, Bruce. Um, and yeah, just um, on the hydrogen front, um, you know, we're, we'll have uh, our smaller turbine operating later this year in a first commercial project at 100% hydrogen. And then the, the, the 200 kilowatt turbine is on, a, a, on the roadmap uh, to be developed at 100% hydrogen after the C65 is done. So I will share my screen here. Great. Um, so real quick, Capstone um, is a uh, public company founded in 1988, and we went to, into commercial operation about 10 years later. Um, the first 10 years of our existence was spent developing the different pieces of the technology to have a commercially viable microturbine. Um, unlike a lot of the other smaller microturbines or or small turbines that are out there. We're not a uh, adapted APU or, or technology from another application. We are a ground up dedicated microturbine. Um, we are the world leader in microturbines. We have about 112 patents around the technology. Um, Bruce mentioned one moving part, air bearings, no lubricating oil, no coolant. Um, that's one of our, our foundational technologies that enables us to do some of the things that others in the space can't do. Um, we have manufacturing here in California uh, with a remanufacturing facility in the UK. We have 60 plus full-time distributors and um, some additional OEM partners like, like 24 seven and over 60 million operating hours. So it's a very proven technology um, that, that 24 seven is chosen to, to use. Um, Capstone thinks um, as a partner with, with our customers and our, our project developers, um, we wanna have long-term relationships. And we also have been focused on uh, cleaning the environment and reducing carbon footprint since, since our inception. And there's some, some data here about uh, our, our carbon reduction and some of our financial savings for our customers. So we're very excited to take that to the next level with 24 seven, where we don't have to have any combustion unless, unless the customer chooses to. And that combustion through the 24 seven turbine that we've modified with, with 24 seven can be renewable energy. Um, and again, lining with our stakeholders, our customers, ESG is important. Um, it's important to Capstone and it's important to our customers. Um, and I think that uh, what it says about our business and what it says about your business is that we're here to um, not only make money for our shareholders and our customers, but also provide environmentally friendly solutions to, to move from where we are in the energy space to a sustainable, renewable future. Bruce, you know, meant, you know, a lot of talk about uh, microturbines. Capstone on Earth Day of this year, thank you, Bruce, um, changed our name from Capstone Turbine Corporation to Capstone Green Energy. Um, for the last few years, we've been doing more and more projects where we're combining technologies and developing technologies to help with that transition from a fossil fuel foundation for energy to a renewable foundation. And uh, we, you know, we've got uh, the relationship with 24 seven as well as some of the hydrogen work we're doing and thermal energy storage, battery energy storage, all of these technologies combined give customers the choices that they need to transition more quickly 
from the current energy environment to a renewable environment. Um, I think one of the things that, that was also part of the decision making for 24-7 for is selecting Capstone as their turbine provider was our global footprint. So we've got turbines in 83 countries, all seven continents. Um, we kind of go where our customers go. So we will be there along with our distributors supporting the 24-7 project from conception to installation to long-term maintenance on, on the turbines. Kind of gives you a little idea of, of where our you know what our distributor network looks like. Um, you know, it's it's uh, adds about 600 employees to the capstone, 130 or so employees, and provides us a very geographic geographically diverse um, network to help support the deployment of these technologies. And then one of the things that uh, is foundational for us and our customers and sort of ties into that long-term relationship is um, at the time of the purchase of the turbine, we'll fix the maintenance costs for up to 20 years. So we'll sign a long-term, we call it factory protection plan. It's a long-term service agreement that covers all of the planned maintenance and all of the unplanned maintenance for up to 20 years. So we, we become, you know, we make money when you make money, when the turbine runs, you're making money and we're not spending money fixing it. And so it really aligns our, our interest. And it also gives us the kind of relationship that we'd like to have that uh, helps to ensure that the turbine is operating at peak performance to reduce any downtime. Um, and uh, it's all um, available as a standard product. I think that was, that was, that was what I had, Bruce, and I'm um, looking forward to any Q and A at the end that I can help with. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. So much. Um, I guess if you stop sharing, I'll uh, I'll start sharing again. And to um, everybody in the audience, if you want to send your questions through, now it's the time. Say, so, yeah, over to you, Bruce. Yeah. So just to summarize here about this amazing turbine. It does produce electricity without combustion. Uh, it integrates with other power equipment, for example, in a microgrid uh, kind of combination. It's a very robust um, oil and gas grade industrial product. Uh, very low maintenance, as Jim said, typically four to eight hours a year. That's partly because of the air bearings and, and lack of fluids. Uh, fluids aren't necessary, very long life. And, uh, and we've added an exterior, we've removed their combustor, we've added a high temperature heat exchanger, and then we've also added outside of the turbine package, a backup uh, inline duct combustor. So you're probably, many of you are probably scratching your heads. How do you, you know, how do you use ambient pressure hot air to drive a turbine? And uh, like I like to say, it's not easy. Um, uh, we removed the combustor, but we've added a high temperature heat exchanger in series with the uh, turbines recuperator, the low temperature heat exchanger. So we can take hot air from any source. And by that, we mean at least 850C. Concentrated solar power, a thermal storage system uh, like ours has, for example, um, and or, or even exhaust, hot exhaust air like from a thermal oxidizer or other industrial system uh, process and, and, and put it through this, this heat exchanger, which is heating the, uh, the compressor air that's going first through the recuperator, the low temperature heat exchanger, and then through our high temperature heat exchanger. And by this time it's reached the turbine inlet temperature and pressure. So this is the whole system and shows you where the components are with the receiver at the top, the, uh, the turbine, in fact, there are two of them uh, on, the, on the ground and the thermal storage system uh, next to it. Our heliostats, uh, there are seven or eight really outstanding heliostats in the world uh, that can uh, readily produce these uh, thousand degree C temperatures. It's the receiver that's the tricky part where you have to take all that sunlight, turn it into first heat and then turn that heat convert that, uh, transfer that heat over to a working fluid, which in turn 
does something useful. Uh, so the the, uh, uh, the the heliostats reflect their light up on top of the, the tower. Uh, the cooler air from below, from the thermal storage and from the turbine, rise through the whole system, are heated in the receiver, come down at that uh, almost thousand degree temperature. Uh, part, part of it flows through the uh, storage system and part of it goes directly to power the turbine. At night, the air flows in the opposite direction through the storage and back to the turbine. Well, we've taken the heat exchanger and the turbine, we've put them together to create a, what we call an all night battery. Uh, so we're also in that sort of long duration uh, storage uh, battery uh, market as well. We've, so we've integrated the storage, and in this case, it's a horizontal shipping container size unit uh, with a, a turbine, the 200 kilowatt turbine, and we've added uh, thermal resistance coils in that blue section there. We pass air through those when there's extra electricity on the grid that's up for the taking, and uh, we use that heat to heat the thermal storage. And then at night, um, or when the wind's not blowing, uh, we take that heat back out of the storage system and power the turbine. And typically, uh, it's a it's a one it's a 200 kilowatt, uh, 1.8 megawatt hour turbine. So it's nominally nine hours, but depending on how you operate it, we can get longer durations. And it's also uh, relatively inexpensive to add more storage uh, to the same unit. The important thing about this battery, though is that even when it's fully discharged, it can operate 24 seven because it burns fuel. And uh, these batteries will last a very, very long time. And they can be deployed at larger scales too. So we've got these three technologies, the two products that I mentioned and multiple applications. We, our intention is to be the lowest cost supplier of, of carbon free electricity and heat which is also applied to desalination, which has to operate 24 hours a day. Any green carbon, any carbon capture technology is gonna to have to operate 24 hours a day. We can also deliver CHP, combined heating and power to industry, using both electricity and heat for, for, for industrial facility. And I mentioned ultra heat, uh, where we can use the heat directly for industrial process, microgrids, uh, and, and this is really important. This is an example. All these really are examples of how uh, modular technology can be, uh, has so many more applications uh, than, than large scale. Uh, cost is everything. Uh, I'm gonna zip through this really quickly. And I apologize because we're running short of time, but um, these are our cost projections and you can see how the curves for the solid curves for our system are approaching um, with mass production, mass production, uh, PV prices and combinations of PV plus batteries. And I won't go right now into the, uh, the cost benefits of, the, of our battery. The interest in our technology is unbelievable. And we have activity all over the world. Our very first commercial scale 24 seven solar plant and our heat store all night battery are being built today in Arizona and it'll be operational early next year. But we're, as you can see, we're in active sales discussions all over the world, not shown as India. India has emerged as a very, very active location for us. So uh, thank you, Fred, for your, for your quote here on the right. Uh, I know Fred Morris is online here and uh, we're ready for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce, uh, Jim and Reiner for your presentations are all very interesting and well, we can see here that there are a number of questions. So whenever you're ready, Bruce, if you stop sharing, then we can go um, through that. So um, uh, Craig Turchie uh, says, many advantages to your modular approach. Uh, can you uh, provide estimated solar to heat efficiency and net turbine efficiency? Yes, I sure can. Um, first of all, uh, these, these turbines from Capstone are as efficient as you can get in this, in this field. Uh, their electricity, uh, their efficiency is measured by electricity divided by 
uh, the power, the energy required to make that electricity uh, is about 33% at, under ISO conditions. Uh, the efficiency of a CSP system is measured very differently. Uh, efficiency of CSP systems typically are measured on an annual basis. And it is the amount of electricity that's produced divided by the amount of sunlight energy that's hitting the heliostats over the course of a year. And, and typically for CSP systems, these, are, these annual efficiencies are in the range of 14 to 17, 18%. They may have gone up since I, I, uh, I studied that uh, percentage. Um, DLR uh, and Reiner's team uh, estimated that ours would be around 21%. Uh, we don't know what the number is. We'll have that for you next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, um, right, there is a, a question here going directly to the cost. So, you know, I think it's, it's difficult to offer, um, you know, straight figures, but uh, maybe you could give us our estimates on uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, Ross estimate Bassam Dali asks, what is the best levelized cost of heat you can deliver at, say, uh, 970 centigrades? I'm reluctant to, to share uh, LCOEs or even um, levelized cost of heat because there's so many extraneous factors that re relate to it, like debt equity ratios, interest rates, uh, term. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. But what I can say is that we are quoting uh, cost today for our CSP system, the CapEx that is not for, for, let's say a 10 megawatt system, that is not much higher than the 70 megawatt, 700 megawatt CapEx at the Dubai plant that's being built. So we're at the top of our cost curve we're gonna be able to move down our cost curve quickly. The, the LCOE in Dubai for that 700 megawatt system is around eight cents, call it eight cents. And, and now there are systems as we know that are uh, being developed at lower cost uh, in China, uh, in Chile, uh, the bids uh, in both locations are quite, quite low uh, compared by comparison with the, with the Dubai uh, cost. Um, and we, Today, we cannot compete with those numbers. We need volume to get our costs down. But our target in the United States, high costs are four cents or less. And of course, elsewhere, for example, India, where their costs might be, you know, uh, a third to half, uh, we're expecting much lower LCOEs. Thank you, um, Bruce. And um, another question, um, uh, by Craig Turchie. It says, um, air is a convenient heat transfer fluid, but not very efficient. How do you mm -hmm. minimize parasitic losses due to blowers and pressure drop through heat exchanges and storage? There's little doubt that that is the key disadvantage of our system, is the fact that we use air. And that, like you said, it's, it's, um, uh, it, it doesn't have a lot of heat capacity. In fact, it doesn't have very much at all. And it requires the movement of large volumes of air in order to transfer the heat that's required. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we engineers tend to like go for efficiency above all else. Efficiency isn't the point. The, the point is the cost of power, right? And so a lot of people chase efficiency, but that's not what the, that's not what the customer buys. The customer buys power at a, at a specific cost. Now, having said that, our parasitics are fairly high. They can be as much as 25% of the output of our system. And so we will deploy our systems almost always with photovoltaic fields, PV fields. And we'll use that electricity during the day to power our, our parasitics and improve the overall uh, efficiency and, um, and, lower the, and, and at the lowest cost uh, possible for our power. Thank you, Bruce. I don't know if uh, Jim or Ryan would like to add anything. You've been rather quiet. Or should we go to the next question? Yeah. Go ahead. There are plenty of questions, I think. Yeah, all right. So um, 
Okay, so um, yeah, there are definitely uh, plenty of questions. And, uh, um, you know, Juan Ignacio uh, Burgaleta asks, uh, what are the main risks you have identified with this technology? And uh, when do you estimate that you'll have a commercial plan in operation? We call the, the systems that we're building in, in Arizona uh, commercial systems. They're commercial scale. Um, but they're, they're ready for commercial deployment. And we'll begin, we'll, we will break ground on commercial deployments in the middle of next year. Uh, the key risks, frankly, are associated with the high temperatures. Whenever you're operating at these high temperatures, you've got associated risks, uh, whether it's in the receiver, the ductwork, or, or in the, or in the uh, heat exchangers. And, um, and that's where we see the greatest risks. But even there, uh, we have an outstanding engineering team. We've had great help from our global uh, development partners, such as, as, uh, as Reiner at DLR. Uh, gotten a lot of help with Capstone. Uh, we, we, we've definitely addressed all the risks that we know of. Um, and it's the ones that we don't know of that I can't tell you about. Well, the nature of the beast. Right, that makes sense. <laughs> so um, the um, right. So um, there's a question here by Alejandro Pagano, and he asks whether your concept uh, is similar to the one developed by ETH and Alstom. Uh, does it also include a CPC? Um, but I think you know, even if you don't know this this concept, how is uh, this concept different to um, other like other similar attempts at modular? Uh, CSP plans out there. Okay, I'm not very familiar with the concept of uh, ETH and Elson, which is uh, indicated here. Uh, at the moment, the main difference to our previous designs is that it's a non-pressurized uh, design, and this has some implications. Uh, for example, on the window design, uh, we we use this to to maintain. Uh, low convective losses uh, at, at these high temperatures. Otherwise, efficiency would be significantly lower. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to the uh, CPC, uh, which you have seen in our other designs in, in the 24-7 solar design, there is no uh, secondary concentrator foreseen because uh, with a good heliostat field, uh, we do not uh, see the necessity to add a secondary concentrator, which then would, of course, add again to the complexity because uh, at these temperatures and uh, the required concentration levels, you would definitely need additional water cooling then at the receiver side. Thank you. Um, Ryan, I don't know if anybody else want, would like to add to this answer. No? Okay. Um, so um, yeah, John Brinkhurst asks if uh, um, Capstone and DLR have installed uh, bases in Africa. Any plans for Africa or, or any? Uh, Jim, why don't you answer that for Capstone? <clears throat> sure. So, so we currently have, um, you know, an installed base of micro turbines in you know, uh, traditional applications. Um, and we're pursuing opportunities with 24 seven solar in Africa, specifically, you know, North Africa, there's a number of opportunities there that we've, we've been pursuing for an extended period of time with, with Bruce and the team. Um, so Africa is a, a growing market for us and, and one that we see um, really being able to take advantage of the 24 seven or the thermal energy storage combined with the simultaneous generation of electricity for, for customers. Thank you, uh, Jim. And, and one question of my own is uh, that, well, we see that right now, I think we're going through a global energy uh, crisis. And I think we can predict that lots of governments like what well, South Africa has been doing for a while will um, issue tenders that will require uh, quick deployment. So, uh, you know, one thing that springs to mind is that um, this concept could be deployed faster being modular. Is that the case? Um, you know, what kind of deployment times would you have in mind for, um, and, you know, could you start 
um, building and uh, providing energy in series, as it were, like on a modular fashion. Uh, the in, the intention is to de, is to uh, begin generating power as soon as you've as soon as you've deployed and commissioned a single the first single module and and then each time you you commission a module you're adding to the total power output the rate of deployment um, right now for a single system uh, once you've actually broken ground gotten all the permit and everything else is going to be at least eight months in the field outside the United States someplace. Uh, probably quicker in the United States. But it's also going to vary depending on how far off grid uh, that application is. Uh, when we get into very large uh, projects, let's say 100 megawatts, we expect to be able to deploy these modules very, very quickly, uh, you know, maybe one or two a week over the, over the course of a year to get to uh, 100 megawatts. Thank you, um, Bruce. And, um... Sergio Castillo asks, how can 24-7 uh, solar technology help Chile uh, produce green hydrogen? So, um, yeah. Well, we, we want to be the 24-hour day zero carbon supplier uh, to hydrogen electrolyzers. Uh, and there are some electrolyzers that also increase their efficiency by up to 20% or their total output um, with heat. And so, that's another uh, benefit of our system is that it produces heat for the electrolysis process and increases the efficiencies, lowers the, uh, the per kilogram cost of hydrogen. And, and Chile is a great place. You have some of the best sunshine in the world. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Best solar resources. Um, so, uh, um, right, let's pick some of the questions here. I don't think we're going to be able to go through all of them, but you know, most of them. Um, so, um, right, there is a question here by um, Javier Rodrigo Duarte, and he asks, uh, the um, injectors and combust combustor liner uh, for fossil fuel operation or backup, are they the same of the standard capstone uh, turbines? Oh, no, not at all. We removed the standard turbine, and on the outside is an inline duct combustor. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, lots of degrees of freedom. Uh, we'll use whatever uh, injectors and nozzles are required for a particular fuel that the customer wants, whether it be a liquid fuel or gaseous fuel. Thank you. And, I, see, uh, I see a question about the heliostats. Please. Um, let, let me answer that because we were really delighted when we put out an RFQ for heliostats recently. Uh, we, got, we reached out to eight different suppliers all over the world. We got responses from seven. Uh, they're all unique and different. All of them could achieve that thousand degree temperature that we need. Um, and there's a lot of competition. We intentionally, at the very beginning when we first invented this concept, we intentionally stayed away from developing heliostats. Uh, we think they require uh, human ingenuity and we didn't think we had a corner on that market. Um, and we felt there was gonna be a lot of competition. Uh, and, and we had our hands full, frankly, you know, developing the other parts of the, of the system. So no, we, we buy them uh, from third parties. Um, thank you, thank you very much. And, and well, we are coming up to the end of the webinar and, and to close, I'd like to um, ask uh, each of you to share, uh, you know, some, thoughts that you may want to, the audience to live with. So I um, don't know who'd like to start. Why don't I go last, Reiner and Jim? I'm happy to, I'm happy to jump in. Um, you, you know, Capstone is, you know, is really anxious and excited to be working with Bruce. The, the, you know, the first project being not too far from the factory will allow us to be there and help with the deployment of the first you know, semi-commercial system, if that's if that's uh, what Bruce is calling it. I think that's a great, great way to, to, to describe it and uh, look forward. Uh, you know, we have lots of capacity. Um, so uh, the more success Bruce has, the more volume we get and we can help uh, bring that cost curve down, which is going to be important to the to the growth and 
sustainability of the business. But we're we're a committed partner to the concept and to, to Bruce and the 24-7 team and looking forward to uh, seeing it grow. So th thank you for uh, having me join today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Right, uh, please. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, DLR as an R and D institution, uh, we we had the chance to follow and support this development now over a certain time, and of course, as an R and D institution, as a researcher, uh, we are very much interested to to see this uh, really in 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 work in operation, and uh, especially also to see if uh, the, the predicted performance uh, really matches what what we have predicted. In our case, of course, regarding the receiver, but of course, we also are very much interested to see this uh, predicted cost reduction to happen with mass production, uh, because it's clear CSP has to bring down cost even more uh, to to be the be a good competitor in the market compared to other renewable options. Thank you very uh, much, Ryder. So, Bruce. so I want to say, of course, thanks to Jim and Ryder both. Uh, they've, they've both been awesome partners uh, and we're looking forward to working, continuing to work with them. Um, I would also invite everybody to, um, you know, reach out to me. And this is a reminder, uh, there's my address, phone number, um, whatever. And um, we would, you know, we, we're excited about this technology and so is everybody else. And we could not wait to bring it to the, to the world to reduce uh, the world's carbon footprint. Yeah, and uh, well, we'll be sharing uh, the slides and the recording as well. So, uh, you know, you'll get uh, Bruce's contact details there. And, uh, um, and well, you know, I'd like to uh, thank uh, all three of you, Bruce, James, Reiner, uh, for being with us today and uh, just sharing uh, your insights and also to everybody who is uh, in the audience as well. Um, so you know, thank you for being with us today. And uh, well, I look forward to seeing you here uh, next time and uh, see what we have planned uh, for you at atainsights.com. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to Carlos, Balin, Andres, and all the ATA. <laughs>